unfortunately, our IT uh, vice president of IT didn't make the trip with us, so we usually have a, a very nice uh, slide presentation to go show the properties that we purchased and the trucking companies that we own and the you know, various things. But I'm going to make it as graphic as I can for you, so you won't even need the slide presentation. <laughs> You're going to understand exactly what we've got. We've got two great technologies, ladies and gentlemen. Both of them involve uh, a great amount of desalination. Um, but let me back up and tell you how the company started. This company was started by some very successful oil drillers in the state of Oklahoma. In fact, the guy who was our original president, Anthony Fiesel, was the gentleman who controlled the drilling and the fracking budget for ExxonMobil for the last 28 years in eastern Oklahoma. He also oversaw all of the acquisitions in eastern Oklahoma for Exxon as well. And as you probably remember, uh, drillers for oil in Oklahoma ran into a major problem in 2014 and 2015. All of a sudden, you have massive earthquakes starting to enter the equation in Oklahoma. In fact, they had an average of about 52 seismic events before 2014. After 2014, they've got about 3,000 seismic events per year. In fact, in 2016, the governor, Mary Fallon, shut down all the disposal wells in and around Cushing and Velma, Oklahoma, because there was a 5.9 magnitude earthquake. She said if it was any closer to Cushing, which is the epicenter of oil and natural gas storage for the United States, it would have been a matter of national security. But you'll notice I said something. She shut down all the disposal wells. Well, everybody thought that the seismic activity was coming from the fracking. And that's sort of intuitive. I mean, it's very concussive. You're setting off virtually charges sort of like C4 to get all these cracks and interstices in the ground so you can get all this oil and this natural gas to come up through the interstices. But after four and a half years of four university studies, including the United States Geological Survey and the Oklahoma Geological Survey, they came up with zero correlation between the seismic activity and fracking. And they thought it'd probably be maybe the thumping because when they drill for oil, they take these 80,000 pound thumpers off of a crane and they drop it and smash the earth as hard as they can to get the E&P waves to go down to determine, hey, is this oil, is this natural gas, is this water under the ground? Well, no correlation between thumping and the seismic activity. What was causing the seismic activity? When they drill for oil and they drill for natural gas, there's a tremendous amount of attendant water that comes out alongside of the natural gas and water, and that's called produced water. And the only game in town for the last 116 years, if you want to get oil or natural gas out of the ground, when you get this produced water that comes out in voluminous amounts, they put it back into the ground in wells that they call disposal or injection wells. And that was 100% correlation between the seismic activity and putting the produced water back into the ground under pressure. So someone might say, well, what, well, how would that cause an earthquake? How? As it turns out, the fault lines in the United States, they don't lie perfectly parallel to the Earth's crust. They don't sit like this. They sit in all manner of oblique angles, but the, normally there's enough stabilization and pressure to keep those fault lines in place until you introduce a very viscous or slippery medium, i.e. oily water under pressure. All of a sudden, the fault lines start to buckle and induces the earthquake and the tremor, and there you, there's your, there's your 3,000 seismic events. Well, streets were cracking, the buildings were cracking. She shut down all the disposal wells in and around Cushing, so the drillers who wanted to get this valuable oil out of these valuable fields, they had to start to take this water and put it on trucks and carry it out to Timbuktu. Well, that adds a lot of cost to your drilling. So they came to us and they said, we understand that you have a recycling solution for this water instead of us putting it back into the ground. And we said we do. Could you bring your recycling solution to Oklahoma? And we made every preparation to do exactly that, to bring it to Oklahoma. And just as we got deep into our logistics to move everything to Oklahoma, we started to receive phone calls from the largest drillers in Pennsylvania. And these drillers in Pennsylvania said to us, we are experiencing a phenomenon up here in Pennsylvania that is not going to allow us to drill for the most valuable field of natural gas in the world. It's the Marcellus Shale. It runs from southwest Pennsylvania all the way to northeast Pennsylvania, and it's the number one repository of natural gas anywhere. I mean, you have to go to the entire country of Russia, and it doesn't even match what's in the state of Pennsylvania. So these drillers were trying to get the natural gas out of the ground in Pennsylvania, and yet there's so much water coming out alongside the natural gas, 
that then when they put it back into the ground in Pennsylvania, the geology was such that the water was getting, uh, all of this produced water was getting into the water table and the groundwater. So it was contaminating all of the groundwater systems. In fact, one county alone, Demick, Pennsylvania, 243 separate instances of groundwater contamination. So the governor shut down all disposal wells in Pennsylvania. I think there's two left, and they're under litigation. So the drillers who wanted to harvest this valuable field of natural gas, the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, had a dilemma. They had to put the water on trucks, and they had to take it over to somebody who would still put it in the ground, Ohio. Ohio would still take it in, put it back into the disposal well. All of a sudden, the earthquakes start to morph from Oklahoma up into Ohio, over into, <laughs> so <laughs> there's a big problem here with putting the water now back into the ground. Well, this water is very contaminated, as you can imagine. It's got cadmium, it's got lead, it's got mercury, it's got toluene, ethylene, benzene, xylene. And when you put this into the groundwater, it's a, it's a bad reaction to the drillers. I mean, they're the pariah of the industry. They're the ones creating the earthquake. They're the ones ruining the water table. So the drillers come to us and say, could you please put this first recycling plant up here in Pennsylvania? We said we could. And then we got a little bit deeper into the business model. And this will be interesting for our investors because we found out that the drillers in Pennsylvania have to pay $10.50 an average per barrel to put it on a truck and cart it over into Ohio to pay a tipping fee just to put the water into a disposal well in the ground. When you add $10.50 per barrel of water, your drilling costs start to go astronomical. But they do want to harvest the most valuable natural gas field in Pennsylvania. So then we said, well, that would work for us because we could come in there and put our recycling plant there. And the $64,000 question was when the drillers asked us, they said, what would you charge us to bring a barrel of water to your recycling facility instead of putting it on a truck and taking it over to Ohio and paying $10.50 per barrel? We said, what if we charge you a little less than $6 a barrel and a little more than 5 they said, how quickly could you put this plant up? Uh, the largest drillers in the world are asking us to please put the first recycling plant there in Pennsylvania. Well, the metrics are this. They would drop the barrel of water off to us, conservatively speaking, for $5 a barrel. That's the tipping fee. Now, the drillers have found out that if they can get the water back at the same water chemistry as their original borehole, then when they redrill and they refrack, they can get between 15 and 20 percent higher hydrocarbon yield than if they drill with water out of the Ohio River, which is what most people do. And the reason for that is when you take foreign water and you introduce it into an original well bore, you get swelling of the clay. And all those interstices that you tried to create with your fracking and tried to get your water and your natural gas and your oil to come up through those interstices, they start to close off. It's not as good. So the driller said, we would buy the water back from you at a dollar a barrel if you can give it to us with the same water chemistry. And of course, we can do that. So all of a sudden, we decided this is a really good business model. We only have one competitor, ladies and gentlemen, in the world right now that actually has a recycling facility. But just to give you an idea of what the scope of the size of this market is, in the United States, they have 38,169 disposal wells. California, North Dakota, Texas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, 38,169. They only have one recycling facility in the country, and it's in Doddridge, West Virginia. The fourth largest driller in Pennsylvania, Antero Energy, asked a company named Veolia if they could build a recycling facility so that Antero didn't have to keep taking this water on trucks over into Ohio because Antero has such large natural gas fields that they create 60,000 barrels of produced water every 24 hours. Every 24 hours, they're putting 60,000 barrels on trucks and carting it over to Ohio and putting it into the ground. So Antero asked Veolia, what would you charge us to put up a plant that would actually process and treat 60,000 barrels a day? And Veolia said, $275 million. Well, Antero did this. They said, well, let's see, $275 million, CapEx, but we're spending 10 million miles of trucking per year to take this water over into Ohio. We're going to build the plant. They put up the plant. It sits right now in Doddridge, West Virginia. Unfortunately, the cost to treat one barrel of water is $10.10 per barrel using that technology, which is called fractional crystallization. 
It's two very high thermal heating events that virtually vaporizes the water and crystallizes the salt. Very expensive, takes a tremendous amount of kilowatt intensity. So that's a lot of money to spend per barrel. We're very fortunate, ladies and gentlemen, we have an engineering team that has sort of cracked the code on the ability to make this cost effective, and we're doing it at approximately one-third the cost of fractional crystallization. It's a six-process stream, and it takes the water, here's the real key, down to dischargeable levels. We can get this very noxious water. And by the way, it not only has the cadmium, lead, the mercury, the toluene, the ethylene, the benzene, it's also got 330,000 parts per million of total dissolved solids, which means it's nine and a half times saltier than seawater. So whatever technology you could think of, whatever comes to mind, reverse osmosis, wastewater treatment technology, membrane technology, they all foul out, egregiously so, when you're dealing with water that's any saltier than seawater. Seawater is about 34,000 parts per million. This is 330,000 parts per million. So any technology that's ever tried to purify or recycle this water, they foul out immediately. We've got a robust system that can take it all the way to the end, gets it down to dischargeable levels. Dischargeable means that it's clean enough to hand to a farmer, so you can put it back on a crop, or you can put it and release it right into a stream according to the 1972 Pennsylvania Clean Water Act. So that's not our best and highest and best use for the water, though. There is so much drilling going on right now in Pennsylvania that they can't handle the amount of water that's coming in. But two events just happened in 2018 and 2019 that increased the amount of water that heretofore existed. Those two events were Ohio made a decision that they wanted to go from 13% of their electricity generated by natural gas-fired plants to 26% of their electricity generated by natural gas-fired plants. That ensued an enormous amount of drilling in the Marcella Shale to provide that amount of natural gas. To bring that on. That's nine and a half billion dollars of natural gas fired plants coming online in the third quarter of 2019. There's a massive amount of drilling and attendant water that's accompanying that. Of course, this current administration decided that they're going to open up the spigots of exportation of natural gas, liquid natural gas, to Europe, and that ensued an enormous drilling campaign. Well, these drillers couldn't handle the amount of water previous to these two new drivers, and all of a sudden, Reliable One Resources took its business model and we showed it to several large funders in the United States and we're very fortunate that we've got a group of investment bankers that are underwriting the first uh, funding of the first plant for us. Only thing is they like the business model so much they said if we're going to give you the money for the first plant, we want the, sec we want the first right of refusal for plants number two, number three, and number four. Well, there are 17,456 natural gas wells in the Marcella Shale in Pennsylvania, it would take us about four a large plants to go ahead and cover the state of Pennsylvania. But can I tell you what the business metrics are for us with the water in Pennsylvania? That we'll be able to do 20,000 barrels a day in the first plant. We've got the site already picked out. It's in Denwood, West Virginia, just three miles south of Wheeling. It serves 6,000 natural gas wells that are in southwest Pennsylvania. So all of this trucking miles that used to have to put the water on the truck and take it into Dover, Ohio, we obviate the trucking miles and we bring the recycling plant right next to where all of the natural gas wells are. Fortunately, in Pennsylvania, these approximately 18,000 natural gas wells are evenly divided between three major trends, southwest, north central, and northeast. And they all clump together. So we can service all of these wells with a 20,000 barrel a day plant in Benwood. A 20,000 barrel a day plant generates a net profit back to reliable of $362 million per year. That's a net profit. The bank and the deal we've made with the funder is that they'll receive a 25% net revenue own of the profits. Theirs is on top of that. So fortunately, reliable is in a great position as far as its stock because we haven't had to use any highly diluted venture capital or private equity. We've funded everything on our accredited investors. We've raised $17 million, all from individual accredited investors, and we've had offers from different capital groups. Of course, the best offer we ever got was they wanted to own 51% of the company minimum. One of the largest green funds wanted to own 80%. Uh, we kept this private, and we've been able to stay non-diluted for our, our partners. So I think our best beneficiaries are going to be our original partners who invested with us and bought the stock while we were private. We do plan on going public, by the way, in the third quarter of next year 
when the first plan has been up and running for three months. Why do I say that? <clears throat> Our original chief financial officer, Richard Barber, who is the former chief financial officer for Bank of America, always preaches one mantra, keep your stock load small, develop a significant income stream. Well, fortunately, the technology is able to develop a significant income stream, and the stock float relative to Wall Street standards is extremely small. It's only 31 million shares. So if you do the math, and whatever metric you're comfortable using as far as Wall Street's price earnings multiples, what is the market right now? That 21 and a half times earnings? In the, in the worst recessions, it's 13. Now it's like 21 and a half. We're going to end up with one plant up and running at about a $6 earnings per share. Of course, with our current funder, we've got the first right of refusal to do the first four. We believe we can cover the entire state of Pennsylvania with four of those plants. So instead of the trucks putting the water on and taking it over into Ohio, we're going to bring the plants right to where the location of the water is, taking this water down to dischargeable levels and selling it right back to the drillers. As you can imagine, there's more than just salt in this water, but every single day that we process 20,000 barrels a day, we're left with 700 tons of salt. This was a big obstacle previously to recycling this water because people had recycling ideas and recycling systems, but everyone fouled out terribly so when you talk about processing water that generates 700 tons of salt per day because tomorrow you have another 700 tons. <laughs> and Fortunately, in the United States, all the way from Washington State over to Maine, these states need a traction control product. They take this sodium and they put it down on the roads, and we've turned what was formerly a refuse stream into a revenue stream because we can preserve the chlorides whole with the process. This process creates massive amounts of sludge every single day. We take the sludge and we convert it through a pellet reactor into calcium carbonate pellets, and we sell that into the construction industry. They use it for their drywall. This was formerly a massive amount of sludge and a residual refuse stream. So now we've got four income streams that used to be refuse streams. They drop the water off to us for $5 a barrel. We recycle it. We sell it back to them for a dollar a barrel. We take the salt. We sell it to the states for a traction control product, and we take the calcium carbonate and we turn it into drywall. There's also a significant amount of fines and minerals in this water. At 330,000 parts per million, this is added to a fifth not so insignificant income stream. So now Reliable has one plant up and running starting in, it takes us about eight months to get it up and running. The funding will be here in approximately the end of July. So it takes about eight and a half months to the end of the construction of the first plant. When that first plant is up and running, that'll throw $362 million net income back to Reliable and the beauty of it is that the funder doesn't own any stock in the parent company. So all of our original investors are not diluted. We've been able to create that wonderful uh, terms with, with them where they're really happy with what they're getting by 25% net revenue owned of the plant for whatever plant they underwrite. After the first four plants, we probably could put up close to 100, which would supplant the 38,169 disposal wells that exist in the United States, because I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, after talking to the EPA officials and the governors, not one of them wants disposal wells to exist in the United States because there's no upside. It's just the only game in town for the last 116 years. If you want to get oil or natural gas, you got to put this produced water somewhere. It was the ground. But now there is an environmentally safe and a cost-effective way to do it. There is no downside to the technology. And remember I told you about our number one competitor, Veolia? Irony of ironies, they came to our plant, uh, our uh, disposal well that we actually purchased a disposal well in Ohio about eight months ago. They came there about three months ago and they said, how much water could we lay off on your property here? And we said, wait a second, you guys just put up a $275 million recycling plant. Why do you want to bring water to us? And they said, well, Veolia told us we could do 60,000 barrels a day, and it's only processing 19,000 barrels a day. So we've got to put this 41,000 barrels a day somewhere. Well, we thought we had a competitor as far as the efficacy of the technology. And now it turns out that our process is at about one-third the cost, and they're not actually able to take the water down to dischargeable levels. Well, it's not as deleterious to 
Antero's business interest, as you might think, because they drill so much. You know what they're doing? They're actually taking that water and they're re-drilling with that water. It's not good, though. It clogs up the wells and clogs up, swells everything. It'd be much better if they could get recycled water, because then they could get a very nice yield from, from their wells. We're going to do all of our questions right at the end, if you don't mind. Um, so what I'd like to s share with you right now is that there is an opportunity for, for our partners that have come in and they've purchased Reliable One stock while we were still private. We plan on going public in the third quarter of 2020 next year because, as Richard Barber counsels us, Wall Street doesn't respect press releases or promises. They want to see the first brick-and-mortar plant functioning for at least three months. They want verifiable margins. But after you have your verifiable margins on your first plant, then they're willing to connect the dots and say, oh, you've also got funding for plants number two, three, and four that are slated to go up right behind that. So now that's probably the right time to pull the trigger. That'll be the best bang for our, our, our investors. Um, our investors are also going to benefit from our, our next technology, which is we've developed a tangential technology that will desalinate seawater. We've been working on this for about two and a half years now. The way that we do it is we use a graphene membrane. Graphene turned out to be an inordinately interesting uh, composite uh, and, and material because it's one atom thick and it's semi-permeable and it lends itself to having pores if you create a second layer on top of it. So that's what our, that's what our engineers did. We took a second layer of reduced graphene oxide plates, we placed it on top of the first layer, and it created some nanotube spacing that was so small that the only thing that was able to make it through in all of our tests in our chambers was the H2O molecules. The pores were extremely small. Everything was getting rejected. Let me give you an example. The molecular diameter of the H2O molecule is 0.289. It's the nanometer. The next molecule up the chain, if you will, is the carbon dioxide molecule. It's 0.331 nanometers. The carbon dioxide molecule gets rejected off the top of the belt when the seawater hits it, as do all the sodium, calcium, and magnesium ions. Everything re gets rejected off the top. Why is that uh, a salient point? Because it's so much different than reverse osmosis, which is the current way of doing desalination. Reverse osmosis works, but it's inordinately expensive. Why? Because they take four different membranes, and by design, they put the membranes in a cartridge called a four-cartridge system, and by design, they misalign the pores on the four different membranes. Then they take a massive amount of kilowatt intensity and push thousands and thousands of gallons of water through the fourth cartridge system. It actually does work. It does sequester the sodium, the calcium, and the magnesium ions between the membranes, but the key word and the operative word is there, between, because you create a massive amount of sludge and clogging in the membranes when you do it. So for every million gallons of seawater that we're desalinating today, we need 500,000 gallons of fresh water on the back end just to unclog all the nanoscreens and the micropores. Otherwise, we're going to clog the system on every run. We have massive amounts of kilowatt intensity involved in, involved in reverse osmosis, so the only ones who can afford to do this basically are the Gulf states. They've resigned themselves. We're going to trade petrodollars for clean water. They can't do it in developed countries. We have a partner right now that's funded by the World Bank with an organic farming system that can't make the farming system work. They're waiting for us to deliver the full salination, desalination of the seawater. We have done it about a year and a half ago with our first iteration where we laid down the second layer of reduced graphene oxide plates, but we relied on the nanotube spacing of those two layers to create the pores. As you can imagine, the pore sizes ended up being random, and the pore spacing ended up being random. So even though it was working, we couldn't quote an actual flux rate that was uniform for a commercial system. So that was the big challenge for the last two years. Everybody's been trying to crack that code. Fortunately, our team of engineers have been the first ones to be able to do it, and now we have uniform pore spacing and uniform pore sizes in the graphene membrane that's yielding a better flux rate than the RO membranes, which are cellulose triacetate, and a better chloride rejection rate. We've only done it on a one meter by one meter swap of graphene. Well, what we're working on right now is extrapolating that graphene up. We have a patented desalination unit. It's approximately three and a half feet wide by eight feet long. 
and it's a conveyor belt that sits at the bottom of the chamber. The seawater comes in from a higher vantage point. The graphene runs on top of the conveyor belt. As the conveyor belt hits the seawater, the graphene is super hydrophilic. It sucks the H2O molecule right into itself. Everything else is left on the top. We have an air knife that blows off all of the chlorides off into its own separate vat. If you can provide the, preserve the chlorides whole, that's, an, that's another income stream as well. So we are working on that and getting that up to size. If we're successful at three and a half feet wide by eight feet long, as we've been successful at one meter by one meter, then this will be how desalination will be done worldwide because it's approximately one-ninth the energy cost of reverse osmosis because we're using one atmosphere of pressure in the chamber. And in reverse osmosis, you have three separate pressure events. One is, the first one is to 200 PSI. The second one is 400 PSI. The third one is 800 PSI. And the final one is 1600 PSI. And to create that amount of pressure, you've got an enormous amount of electricity to do that. So no backwashing in our system because there's no middle, no clogging. And we're using the ambient pressure in the chamber to be able to do the desalination. So we're really excited about this. And as philanthropic and as sublime as this solution could be, it, it will pale in comparison, however, to the, uh, the income that the, will be generated from our oil water separation technology, our recycling. As you can imagine, the bank was interested in one major issue. They wanted to make sure that we were going to have 20,000 barrels of water coming to the plant every single day. That's the capacity of the plant. The banks were all about risk mitigation. So they said, how are you going to guarantee that you're going to get 20,000 barrels a day coming to the plant every single day? Well, we said there's 2 billion gallons a day going into the ground for the last 50 years. They said, well, what if it stops? What if they stop drilling for oil? Well, it could happen, I guess. <laughs> I guess. But we said, what if we bought four of the larger trucking companies that are carrying the water from the natural gas fields in Pennsylvania and dropping it off to the disposal wells in Ohio. What if we purchased four of those large trucking companies? The bank said, that would raise our comfort level enough. Our checkbook is open for you to go do just that. So we've got the four of the best trucking companies in Pennsylvania that now have master service agreements to carry this water for 16 years from the natural gas fields in Pennsylvania over to the saltwater injection wells in Ohio. And those trucks will go ahead and pick up the water from the drillers, and they will just drop it off at our plant, which will be extremely close. So all of this mileage that used to be incurred will now be pretty much reduced down to several miles, the R trucking company picking up the water. And what we did in the meantime is we actually purchased one of the trunk companies on our own. Our investors came in and said, hey, we like this one trucking company. Um, it had an offer from a major hauler. We didn't want it to go away. The bank wanted it, so we, we stepped in and we, we bought that first trucking company. We also purchased a disposal well in Ohio. And you say, why would you guys be di purchasing a disposal well? Because the disposal well has 4,500 barrels a day coming to it in master service agreements of water dropped off. And between the trucking companies that are carrying 23,000 barrels a day and 4,500 barrels a day of water contracted to come to the disposal well, we now have 27,500 barrels a day, which is enough redundancy to convince the bank, oh, okay, you guys are going to have at least 20,000 barrels a day coming to you no matter what happens. So that was an important position. So now Reliable owns its own uh, disposal well in Coolville, Ohio. It owns its own uh, trucking company, its first one. And we're, we're slated and poised right now uh, to have this first plant operational in about nine months. It's right on the Ohio River. It's just south of Wheeling. And everything that comes to that plant right there, uh, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a real boon to be on the Ohio River because everything can be shipped out you know, as far as the salt, as far as the calcium carbonate pellets, and all the residual things that we're taking out of the water right now. So this is going to be a change on a paradigm shift of the highest magnitude. Uh, if you've ever said to yourself, I really believe that water is going to be the most valuable commodity going forward, um, I believe that, a bit that the business case uh, for Reliable One Resources is that you've got two of arguably the top technologies in water uh, that we have patented right now on the oil water recycling technology and the desalination technology that will redound to the benefit of our investors. And I don't think you're going to have to wait very long at this point. Uh, our investors, we started about three years ago. Our first investors, there was a, 
there's a modicum of risk when we first started because we didn't have anything except for this technology. Now we've got so far along where we have the full funding commitment from one of the most successful investment banking groups in the Midwest, and, um, and we've got two properties under our belt already. So I think that our partners that are involved in coming in now are going to be the, the best beneficiaries because we squeezed most of the risk out of the equation, and yet we're still selling our stock right now to our money show partners because our money show partners got us started. We've done everything through our money show partners. We've raised um, all of our fabrication dollars, all of our engineering, all of our um, R&D, all of our legal, everything, all the patents, everything's been done on the backs of our accredited investors from the money show. So to them, we've been very indebted. But I think they're going to be the best beneficiaries. They bought the stock at $1.50, and sometime in 2020, we'll pull the trigger on the IPO. We're going to use the same stock transfer agent when we do our, our, our IPO, so it'll be a seamless transition. Our folks can buy the stock right now privately through the PPM. Then once we do the IPO, uh, the stock transfer agent will notify all of our stockholders. Reliable is going public, and we'll, we'll trade in your private shares for your public share through the QSIP number. We have our brochure right here, which is uh, less reflective of what the current income is going to actually be on the plant because <clears throat> we found out that we can take more things out of the water than we originally suspected, and that's what's leading to a conservative estimate of about $362 million net income coming to Reliable from one plant up and running. But we really, really believe we'll be having approximately four in the state of Pennsylvania just to cover what's happening right now in the Marcellus Shale. And I can tell you right now that the governors and the EPA officials they would like to legislate to dispose of wells out of existence if there was a cost-effective and environmentally safe way of doing it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, there is. Our closest competitor uh, is, is $10.10 .10 a barrel. We're, we're about $3.46 a barrel. But what we're taking out of the water and the four different income streams that are coming to us from that uh, add up to incredible margins uh, that are going to redound to the benefit of our investors. So we are located at Booth. Um, what's 210? And we are available to answer any questions regarding the stock, the opportunity, the technology, whatever you guys would like to talk about. But we wanted to be, just be sensitive to the folks who are going to come in um, behind us for the, uh, for the next presentation. But you guys had a choice today. I noticed that were several provocative meetings and speakers that were available today, and you chose to be with us. So for that, we're very grateful. I hope you decide to join us because I think it's going to be an excellent ride. And this is an impact investment. It's good for the environment. It's good for the drillers. It's good for the country. And it's good for our, our investors. So thank you so much for joining us today at Reliable One Resources.